man. Things work. Good morning, everyone. I am Voice, a.k.a. Pastor Q. Thank all you guys for tuning in this morning to our morning broadcast. Our scripture reading this morning will come from the book of Psalms. That's the book of Psalm uh, 139. Turn me to the book of Psalm 139, and the reading will come from uh, verse 12 through 17. That's the book of Psalm 139. Uh, the verse, the reading will come from um, Psalm 139, verses 12 through 17. Gwen, you want to read it? Uh -huh. Oh, just for open oh, system, Melissa, you come on over here. So, um, Psalm 139, verse 12 through 17. My niece, Melissa, she'll come up and read the scripture for us this morning. Amen. All right. Psalms 139, verse 12 through 17. Even the darkness is not dark to you, the night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I promise you, for I am fearful, fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. In truth. In truth. Intricately. Uh -huh. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. Amen. 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 <laughs> <laughs> big old King James words, SAT words. King James. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. So listen, the key scripture that I want you guys to focus on this morning will come from the book of Psalm 139, and that was the 14th verse, where he says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. He's, God is telling him, say, listen, I will praise you because what you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be able to see this day. I thank you for your word. Cover it. Bless in the name of Jesus. Give me the wisdom to be able to speak it, O oh, Father God, to relay your message as it has been given to me. Thank you, Father God, for the confidence in you, not in confidence in me, that no flesh may be glorified in your presence, O oh, Father God. But I speak, O oh, Lord, as a man, O oh, Father God, humble myself before you, that you may to be able to be exalted. I um, know that if you be lifted up, you'll draw all men unto you. Thank you, O oh, Father God, for the prophecy. Thank you for your word that's been given to me to be able to speak, Lord. I'm honored to speak your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are fearfully and wonderfully made. I want you guys to know that. Listen, I read something that Pope Francis, Pope Francis has something that he said to a gay man. I want you to read what he says. It says, a victim of a clerical sexual abuse has said that Pope Francis told him that God made him gay and that his sexuality does not matter. Uh, Pope Francis goes on to say, you know, Juan Carlos, that does not matter. God made you like this. God loves you like this, right? So the Pope tells a gay man that God loves him, and he also tells him that God made him that way, and God loves him that way. And I just want to back that up with some scripture uh, because I want you to understand that the Bible teaches us that uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, so my thing is that when when I just want to kind of piggyback or kind of go up against what the Pope was saying, he said that God made him that way and God loves him that way. Let's, let's understand the Bible says that God loves us as we are. He accepts us as we are with the intentions of not leaving us that way. We must understand that, listen, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for our sins. Where I'm going is that, listen, while you were sinning, God did a act, right, and died on the cross for your sins exactly where you were at. And listen, so before uh, you decide to come to him for the saving knowledge, God had already created a way to be able to fix the way you were. And that's where, where I'm going with this. Understand this. The Bible says that uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. When, you, when I want you to understand, when you are fearfully and wonderfully made, i got to give it to you this way for you to be able to understand the teaching, how I'm going to teach um, a little bit anti against what the Pope said. Genesis 1.26 says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, uh, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, of, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Notice this, that God created man with what? Dominion. 
when God has given us dominion. Old people want to say that we are king's kids. But you have to understand kings have dominion. God said he's given us power. He's given us authority. That's what the Bible said, that God is able to speak those things that is not as though they are. And the Bible says death and life is in the power of the tongue. And those that love it shall uh, eat the fruit thereof. Notice this, that God spoke everything into existence. The Bible didn't say that God did a whole bunch of creating. It said he did a whole bunch of what? Speaking. So my thing is that the Bible says if God did a lot of speaking, that everything he spoke came into existence. And if you had to understand that we take on the same form of God, we can do the same thing too. I am able to speak myself into what? Existence. Because God spoke things into existence. But we must understand this too. The Bible said that he who serves God must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. So if I worship God in spirit and in truth, and I was created in the image of God, the image of God doesn't mean that God looks like you and I when he have hands and toes and all those things like that. What it basically means is this. What's going on, bro? What it basically means is this is what? God doesn't have a body like we have a body. We must understand that God is a what? A spirit. And then when the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, they're talking about God created us in the spirit. A lot of times people misunderstand when God is talking about I am a spiritual being. I am a spiritual being in a body that God formed. Now we must understand if I go take you over to the book of Genesis, it says what? God formed man from what? The dust of the ground and he became a living soul. Well, that makes it like, seem like a contradiction because God created a man in Genesis 1 and now he's saying that he formed a man in what? Genesis 2. I want to teach you that. The man that he formed in Genesis chapter 2 was basically the shell. The shell, which you see, you go to a funeral, what you see is the shell because the body says to be absent from the, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, to live as Christ, die as gain. So listen, though you're having a funeral for me, you're not having a funeral for me, you're having a funeral for my shell. So listen, I, that's why I'm not big on funerals because that's not who the person is. That is the what? Shell. Right now, you know me by my shell. I'm hoping that you get to know me by what? My spirit. Women, when they look good, look on the outside. Men, we look good on the outside. People know you and they're attracted to your what? Your shell. And you say, I really want you to get to know my what? Spirit. Because a lot of times we're, time we're beautiful on the outside and we're ugly on the inside. Jesus said that to the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, you just remind me of uh, graves or caskets. He said, you look good on the outside, but the inside you're dead. And that's what God is trying to get us to understand. He created a shell for the man that he was going to put inside of that shell, which was a spiritual man. So when the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, God was talking about our spirits. He was not talking about our flesh. Notice this. He said he created us in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. He says, I'm going to create man in what? My own image. After the, Im after the image of God, he created them, what? Male and female. So we look like God in spirit. Does anybody know what their spirit looks like? No, we don't know what our spirit looks like. We have never seen our spirit. Every time you think of a spirit, you think about smoke and lights and all those things. But the thing is what? You are spirit. Let me teach you something about your spirit. It's amazing that when Jesus, after he was resurrected, he came back in a new body. The body what Jesus had, he was able to walk through walls. If you go back into the old in the New Testament, when Jesus came back to visit the disciples, he had a different body. Matter of fact, he said, listen, you can't even touch me because he had not yet um, been uh, to, to be ascended to his father yet. He couldn't be touched because he was now walking in the spirit. The Bible tells us to walk in the spirit that you shall not what? Fulfill the lust of the flesh. How can I walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh? He's telling me to what? Walk in the newness. Now I'm going somewhere with this too. When people say, well, Pastor Q, how can I walk in the spirit? The only way you can walk in the spirit and not identify with the flesh is you what? Must be born again. When man took from the tree of knowledge and good and evil in the Garden of Eden and disobeyed the commandments of God, man died in the garden. The garden was a representation of heaven here on earth. Man was protected. It was God and the garden was heaven on earth. Notice when man disobeyed God, God kicked him out of the garden. And allow him to take part of the ground in which he formed him. So let me say this. Man died in the Garden of Eden. Because notice what God told the man and the woman. He said, listen, do not take from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. So with you, the day that you take for it, the Bible says that what? You shall surely die. They didn't physically die because they were still moving around, but they died in spirit. So what happens is the man that God created in Genesis chapter 1 died. And when the man took of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, he became the man in Genesis chapter 2. That's why when God showed himself, when, uh, when God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam hid from him because he, was, he used to be 
when God came into God and he would embrace God because he was spiritual. But when he became a physical man, he ran and hid himself from God. He says, God says, why did you run and hide from me? He says, because God, I knew that I was naked. Going back to what the Pope said, the Pope said that what? God made you that way and God loves you that way. Well, why didn't Adam, why did Adam run from God if God made him that way? You know, the thing about it is, is that Adam ran because he was no longer the man that God created. And he knew he was no longer the man of God created. Let me teach you something. Most of us run from God when we recognize we are not who what God created. Isn't that why we're running from God? Don't you have a self-knowledge about yourself and a self-knowledge about your own personal sin and it caused you to run from God? Why are you running from God? Why are you not in church? Why don't you have a relationship with God? And you say the reason why I'm pastor is because I know some things about myself and that which I've known have caused me to be able to what? Go and run and hide like Adam. So when God comes, I run and hide and I try to cover myself up and though I hear him speaking, I'm still hiding. He said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, what? He said, Lord, I hid myself. And he said, listen, because I'm naked. He said, Adam, who told you you were naked? You were naked the whole time. What Adam was basically trying to say is this. I died and I have taken on a new knowledge. And now I know some things about myself that has caused me to go what? Hide from you instead of what? Embrace you. So many people want a relationship with God. But when you tell people about the love of God and why they should be close to God, the first thing a person will say is, listen, I still do this. I still do this. And I still do that. They remind you of why they're not in relationship or covenant with God. That comes from a false knowledge because a person identifies himself or identifies identifies the love of God based off where they feel they're at according to what the word of God says. A person looks at the word of God and say, you know what? Since I can't be accepted by God, I'm going to what? Run from God. What the Pope told the man who, um, the, uh, the, Pope, the Pope told a man who had a sexual abuse. He says, listen, God made you gay. And he says, what? He loves you that way. Listen, what, 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 what the Pope has to be careful to understand too is that first and foremost, God doesn't make a man with choices. He made you a spiritual being. He put you in a body. But when you died spiritually, you became your flesh. Let me teach you something about DNA and genealogy real quick. Though God has given you a spirit, the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, he says that before I formed thee, I knew thee and I ordained thee to be a prophet before the nations. What that means is this. God says, when I formed you, I formed you spirit. I gave you dominion. I made you ruler over some things, but God says when you died, what happens now you became flesh. Now let's talk about what's inside of your flesh. Now, when somebody says, um, I'm this way, you must understand I'm a product of what? My mom and my dad. My mom and dad got together, so now I take on the DNA of my mom my dad. Let me teach you something. Whatever witchcraft or what a demonic spirits or sexuality that your mom and dad dealt with, dealt with, when they birthed you, they put that inside of you. So what happens now that those things are inside of you, it has nothing to do with your spiritual. It has everything to do with your flesh. If your father had a problem with pornography, playing with himself, your mother, vice versa, her sleeping with women, your father dealing with men or whatever type of things they intertwine with, those things were birthed inside of you. And now, guess what? When your thoughts come, those are what? Your first things is going to filter through your mind based off of what your parents birthed you into. When Adam and Eve took from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, they brought us into a curse. They, in all type of things, sickness came. That's why man was no longer able to live forever because sickness came when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And now man is no longer able to live uh, forever. He dies because of the sicknesses of sin. Jesus says, well, I came to heal them. He said, I came not for the righteous. He came, what, for those who are sick. He said, those who are well do not need a physician. So sin brought forth sickness. Sickness have all different type of um, emotions. And uh, all, all, all type of things that it desires, all because of what? A sickness. If you open up the door, everything comes in. So what happens is, is this. We must understand that, listen, we died in the Garden of Eden, spiritually. And now we become a what? We become physical beings, but that's not who God created us to be. He allows us to be that way. Go back to the book of Psalm, what he was saying. He says, what? You are fearfully and what? Wonderfully made. He's talking about your spirit. But let me go back to your DNA with your parents. Whatever your mom and dad were dealing with, they birthed you and now you have that in you. 
I'm pretty sure if you was able to talk to your mom and dad, they're still alive, and then you talk to them, you guys share some of the same things. If your father dealt with alcohol, you deal with it. Or whatever it is that your family dealt with was actually passed on down to you. I like to touch on this because a lot of people like to remind me of Pastor Q. I'm dealing with a generational curse. And a generational curse is inside of your flesh. But the curse can be broken if you're born again. To be born again means what? That I'm getting the spirit back that God gave me in Genesis chapter 1 to give me back the dominion that was lost. So that's why I need to be born again. If you turn to the book of John chapter 3, I think Jesus tells it to uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He says to Nicodemus, there was a man, uh, John chapter 3, there was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus and rulers of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a great teacher come from God. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why is God trying to get you and I to be born again? God needs you to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to be born again that you may receive a new spirit. Now when God gives you a new spirit, it's no longer about your emotions and what you feel. Let me teach you something. A lot of times what God is teaching you in the word, he's trying to teach you about who you are in the spirit. And we keep dealing with what? The flesh. That's why the Bible says what? Trust the Lord with all thy heart, lean not to thy own understanding, all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall what direct thy paths. God says get out of your feelings and, and emotions and get into your spirit. Listen, you're neither straight nor gay in your spirit. You have, listen, even in heaven, even if you're married here on earth, you will not be married in heaven because there has, sexuality has nothing to do with spirit. When God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made, the reason why you don't know who you are in God because you keep identifying with the losses and the, the, the worthlessness of your flesh and God has called you to be able to understand who you are in your what spirit. People keep preaching to my flesh. I know who I am in the flesh. I know I'm adulterer. I'm a liar. I know I'm all these things in my flesh. I know I have attraction for things in my flesh that I shouldn't have, a, have attraction for. But that's why he says walk in the spirit so you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're trying to change people in their flesh when God has called them to be reborn again to be able to change them in their spirit. Mm -hmm. Let me teach you what. When you get to heaven, your sexuality won't matter. You won't be in heaven sleeping around. You, you, the Bible says you will become as the angels. The angels don't reproduce. Your sexuality, you won't even be hungry in heaven. The Bible says, I want to go to a place where there's no more sorrow and no more, more, more pain. Why people keep teaching against my flesh if I'm supposed to be born again in the spirit? You must understand there's a spiritual man who God is more concerned about underneath the flesh. And when God saves you, he's saving you for the potential and that which he created you to be. He told Jeremiah, he says, before I formed thee, I knew thee and I ordained thee to be a prophet before the nations. So when God sees you at your low, he says, yeah, you see yourself at your lowest. You may be at your lowest, but I know what I formed. I know what I created. There's a spiritual man inside of you that I'm trying to be able to awaken. If I can awaken the spiritual side in you, then the outward won't even matter anymore. And the reason why you can't see yourself the way God sees you is because you identify with the flesh and not with the spirit. You're, the Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is nothing wrong with you. Listen. We put on makeup, we put on clothes, we hide behind things like Adam did because what? We're afraid and we don't feel worthy of what of God. But the Bible says what? Those who worship God must worship and serve him what? In spirit and in truth. It's not in your flesh. That's why Jesus came. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are trying to please God based off the law. But the Bible says by grace have you been saved, not by works that any man should be able to boast. Notice this, that when God came through with the deaf angel, he had them to mock the doorpost with the blood of the lamb. And when the doorpost was mocked with the blood of the lamb, it said that the deaf angel passed through. The deaf angel was not the devil. The deaf angel was sent by God. And only way God, you kept God's protection in that time, if you had the covering of the blood on the doorpost. And that same thing, the covering of the blood of the lamb still represents itself today. But it's, it's through Jesus because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. When people talk about there's power in the blood, God covers you with the blood because he's more concerned about your spiritual man and not your what? Fleshly man. It's all in your spirit. Yeah, you may have addictions in your spirit. Yeah, you may have emotions in your spirit. You may be, I mean, in your flesh. You may have all these confusions and emotions and all these things inside of your flesh. But understand that's flesh. But God knows who you are in the spirit. Matter of fact, when God speaks to you, he speaks to you through your spirit. He said, my word is spirit. 
My word is truth. So when God speaks to you, he speaks to your spirit. That's why when God speaks some things to you, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't align with the things of your flesh. Have God ever spoken to something to your spirit and it caused you to look at your flesh? God will speak a word to your spirit and it makes you look at your flesh. What I mean by that, God will say some things to you and it'll make you say, listen, I don't know how God's going to do that because I'm looking at myself. God says, you know what? You will receive the word if you've seen who you were in the spirit. The reason why I can't accept the Bible truths and the things that God says, because when I look at God's word, I see it as I see me in the mirror, but I can't see how great I am what in the spirit. You must understand, people looked at David when he went up against Goliath. David was small. He says, yes, I'm small in stature, but when the spirit of the Lord comes over me, I am great in what spirit? You must understand, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Somebody quoted it to me the other day. I had to check that. They said, I can do all things. I can do all, I can do all things. I said, you can't do nothing. You only can do all things through, through Christ. Through what? The word, meaning that I can't do nothing outside of the word. He says the book of John 10, 15 says, without me, I can do nothing. I can do all things through Christ that what? Strengthens me. I only can do these things through what? The spirit. The Bible said it's not by power, it's not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So I can go up against any Goliath, no matter about my stature. Notice this, every time you go through something, you say little old you. You see what you're going through. But you have to understand what Jesus says too. When Jesus was getting ready to be taken and he told the disciples, he says, don't you know right now I can call on God and he will send me 12 legions of angels. Jesus was basically saying, oh, I'm not alone. I know that he would never leave me nor forsake me. I'm greater in spirit. Right. We go up and get people say this all the time. Pastor, God will not allow me to go through something that or, or God will allow me to take on more than I'm able to bear. Well, yeah, you can't. It's, it's more than you can bear in your flesh. But how much can you bear in your spirit? I'm telling you right now, you're greater in your spirit than you are in your flesh. And when you see yourself, you see yourself in the flesh. And I'm trying to be able to get you to see yourself in the spirit. I'm trying to get you to understand that you were made in the image of God. Is anything too hard for God? No. Greater is what? He that is in me. Then he that is in the world. People quote that, that, that scripture and have no understanding of it. He says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Who is in the world? The devil is in the world. The Bible said that the devil is the God of this world. For your adversary, the devil comes by as a roaring lion, seeking whom what? He may devour. I must understand this. God, that's, the spirit that's in me is greater than the spirit that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If God be for me. Who can be against me? I must understand what that scripture means. There's a big if in front of that. People say, God be for me. Who can be against me? No, the scripture say, if, if God be for me, who can be against me? Meaning that, listen, if God cosigns and agrees in what is going on, who can be against me? People talk about the devil doing this and the devil did it. The Bible says, if God be for me, who can be against me? If God be for me. Notice this, we're spiritually and wonderfully made. He tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3, Most surely I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? To be born again must be what? Means to be received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You, why do I have to be born again? Because I died. When did I die? I died in what? The Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve took from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. When you say, Pastor, or I didn't do it, Adam and Eve did it. But Adam and Eve is your ancestors. And since they are your ancestors, that the curse that was in them uh, was drip, was brought on down through us. Because they were our ancestors. So yes, Adam and Eve brought us into sin. So therefore, we must be able to be what? Born again. Unless I'm born again, the promises of God don't stand. Understand, that's why Jesus allowed Lazarus to die. So he can what perform the resurrection. That's what the bird, the um, the resurrection is all about. To be born again. When we get close to Easter. Everybody want to celebrate the resurrection. I've been teaching the resurrection is this win with within oneself. So what Jesus did to Lazarus, he said, you know what I'm gonna do? I know that you're sick. I know that you're dying. I'm going to allow you to die. This is what he teaches. I'm allow Lazarus to die just so I can bring you back. What does that mean to you and I? God allowed the very thing that you and I wanted to do, the sins that had us, to kill us. And you notice this, he never shows up. People say, well, God shows, he, um, he never shows up with you when you want him, but he's always on time. 
Another scripture you can take and just throw out the window. God don't never show when you want when he's always on time. Well, he wasn't on time for Lazarus. You know why? Because he allowed Lazarus to die. So you can take that God don't always show what you want, but he's always on time. People have taken a church saying and made it, um, you, you know, just like a great quote and don't even understand what they're saying. God is not always on time because God doesn't live in time. God doesn't live in a place where he's looking at a watch. God does understand seasons, but God doesn't understand time. People say, well, he don't always come when you want him, but he's always on time. No, actually, he showed up late for Lazarus. He let the worst thing possibly happen to Lazarus, which he let Lazarus die just to bring him back. Let me teach you something. The very thing that you're going through right now may kill you. And when I say kill you, it kills you to a place that you die to your own will. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about spiritual death. When you die to your own will and then God brings you back. Some of us are going through that right now. You have your will. You have everything you want to do. You come to God. God, this is what I want you to do. You've given God the blueprint for your life. You've told God everything what you want to do. And something else you guys say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. God says, okay, I'll sit back and I'll listen to your plan and everything you say you want to do. And I'll let, and I'll let you go out there and try that and when you fail at that come back and ask me what I had for you mm, yeah what's happening right now is what you're doing is that you're operating on your own plan and God says when you done you done come back and I tell you what I have for you but while you out there trying to figure it out and do what you think you're supposed to be doing, that's not who you are. You're identifying from your flesh. And what the flesh always wants to do is uh, uh, imitate something that they're seeing somebody else doing. Notice this. Your spirit has its own peculiar calling because God says what? You are a pe we are peculiar people. So the spirit has a peculiar calling. God is calling you to do something that nobody else does has ever done. When God called me, I understood the calling. It didn't look like what everybody else thought it was supposed to look like. Actually, when God called me to do the calling and people see the way I do it, they say, well, Pastor Q, maybe you should do it this way. I say, no, that's the way that it's, it's always done. Let me do it this way because this was in my spirit to do. And this is what I hear him telling me to do. And I'm going to do it this way until the wheels fall off until, listen, even if nobody supports it, this is what I'm called to do. And I've been standing this for almost eight years is doing it this way. And even people may say it was unorthodox. It's different. But guess what? This is in my spirit. This is what it's called to do. God says, I'm going to use you to call a peculiar people. So what you don't look like, talk like, dress like, or look like the rest of them. There's a lot of people who want to know God, but don't want to have nothing to do with those who have a form of godliness, but what deny the power thereof. There's people who need me, but don't want to have nothing to do with church. There's church people who can't go where you're able to go because they're so full of themselves in church. God says, I'm looking for real regular people to be something extraordinary. God says, I don't call extraordinary people. I call regular people to do an extraordinary work. You must understand when God called you, he called you, he had a mission. One thing I like about when Jesus told him that he was going to go down, I think, to Zacchaeus' house. Or um, one of the uh, tax collectors, or maybe get his name wrong. And Jesus, he, he went, Zacchaeus went up in a tree and Jesus told him to come down from the tree. And he said, listen, today I must dine at your house. He, he dined at a sinner's house. And people kept saying, why would Jesus want to go be at a sinner or die at a sinner's house? People didn't understand because if Zacchaeus allowed Jesus to be in his house, who do Zacchaeus hang around? A whole bunch of other sinners. You must understand, God didn't call you because it's all about you. God networks. You know how people want to get with you because of who you know. I go through it all the time. People want to link up with you and be around you because they're actually trying to be around who you know. Don't get it mistaken. Everybody's not your friend because of who you are. It's because of who you know. And once they get in contact with who you know, they're going to stop being your friend. They're going to stop being their friends. We have a thing in my in, in my code where friends don't be other fr other people's friends. You know, that's my friend. And you, would, you weren't supposed to meet me and make them your friend, but that was your whole intention in the beginning. Jesus has that way of networking too. Jesus says, listen, I want, to, I want to save you because you know a whole other bunch of people who are like you. So invite me into your house so guess what? I can reach those people too. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I want to come and be a part of the sinners. Because guess what? There's more sinners there. And if those sinners see you hanging around me, what's that going to do? That's going to draw those sinners to me. Jesus said, I didn't come to be around the religious people because guess what? The religious people are standoffish from what? The sinners. The church people don't go where the sinners are. And the sinners don't go where the church people go, do we? No, no, we don't do that. We have church bowling functions, church cabarets, church dating sites, Christians mingle. Oh, God, that's, the, that's of God? 
Jesus would be on Christian mingle, dealing with the Christians. He said, I, I, those who are sick, those who are whole don't need a physician, but here you are, you separated Christ, you have degraded Christ, you're Baptist, Pentecostal, Jehovah Witness, you're Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist, you've divided Christ. Look at all the different religions and what you do. Is that Christ? Christ said, guess what? I'm not even coming to deal with the religious people. I'm coming to deal with who? The sinners. Guess what? There's no division amongst the sinners. <laughs> you ever seen division among sinners? Ain't no Pentecostal sinners. Ain't no Baptist sinners. Ain't no Catholic sinners. Sinners are just sinners. Jesus says, I'm going to deal with the sinners because at least they don't have no division. Matter of fact, Jesus says, I feel better dealing with the sinners. Some of you, I know one I know one thing about me, and I hate to say this. I feel better around people who don't know God than people that do know God. Because the religious people are too religious. They're too busy trying to be phony. They have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. I don't want to go to your bishop's ceremony. I don't want to be around no type of churchy type people because they rub me the wrong way because it's phony. They don't have the love of God. They sit back and they judge and are not doing what God has called them to do. Kind of reminds me of the story when the man was stripped and robbed of everything. And the Bible says that a priest and a Levite walked right by him on the street. And it took a Samaritan to come and what to be able to aid his bandages and to take care of him. But all the religious people kept walking. Notice this, that the pastor found very great pleasure in riding by the dope houses in the corners where the people are. But then he'll get up in front of the church and preach about it. But never once have he stopped that old rat. Raggedy Cadillac and pulled it over and preached, but he'll call them to come to church and then if they don't come to church, then they no good. But pastor, tilt that brim the other way and go where they are and preach, but you can't do that because ain't no offering going to be gotten there. Yeah, that's what you do. I'm very much an understanding of that. You don't really want to do the real calling and sometimes you have to step outside of the church. Right. Friday we went down and we spoke to the homeless and we sat out there and it was not even an offering or a basket pass and me and three, four other pastors out there just preaching the word out there on uh, First Street in Northeast right behind Union Station just out there preaching the word and homeless people coming up people who needed to hear the word that was real ministry right there done right in front of my eyes no service, no choir just people out there just preaching the gospel that was the real ministry right there is done outside of the church I will even take away from myself and say right now that listen yes this is ministry what I'm doing but, but to come in here every Sunday and preach to people who are already saved is not what God has called me to do but what God has called me to do is be able to come together and to be able to build and strengthen your faith because the Bible tells us do not to forsake the assembling of yourselves when I come to you with a word I understand I'm coming to you with a word that edifies your spirit to be able to get you through the week to go out there and to be able to do ministry not to come in here and meet up every Sunday like this is a club yes. that's what churches have become it's a place that you meet and it's not effective it's a place that you come and you meet and you give but it's, it's not effective that's why so many people can gather into church but can't do the work of the ministry outside of the church because they keep gathering into it it's become a club it's become a social club we might as well just sit around and just have tea all day it's not effective if God has not given me a word to be able to give to you, to be able to go and to impact the people's lives and people who you go and be around on a daily basis, then what's the point of it? I don't come here just to preach to you. I come here to be able to give you the word that God has given to me, that it impacts your life, that it impacts the lives of the people that you are around. What you don't know right now is that, listen, I'm not just talking to you. I'm giving you a word to what impact the people that's in your life. So when you go to work tomorrow, you have the spirit of God. You're walking in with your head up. And guess what? He said, listen, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father that's in heaven. Understand that I'm talking to you to help your light continue to be able to shine. The Bible says that what? Iron sharpens iron. So, the, so a brother sharpens the countenance of his brother. I come here to be able to what? Light your fire just in case it has been dulled down. When people talk about a revive, only thing God needs to revive you of is his word. You need to come here and hear a word because you and I have had a rough week. Yeah. You've had a rough week. It's been some things that have been going on, and you need to hear a word. Why do I need to hear a word, Pastor? Because this week has been hard. I came here so I can be revived because I got to I gotta go do it again Monday through Saturday until I come back and get another word. But I must understand, too, the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So every morning I wake up looking for my bread, right? Because he says what? Listen, he told them, and once he brought them out of Egypt, that he would give them a daily bread. A daily bread was a representation 
provision of manna. Every morning I wake up, God is giving me manna. There's a word to be able to stand on based off of what I'm going through. God has given me a word. And that word is to help me to be able to what I live off of that word. I stand on that word. He tells Nicodemus, John chapter 3 and 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. When your parents brought you, I mean, uh, gave birth to you, you were born of the flesh. That's why a lot of people identify the things of the flesh. Notice this. People of the flesh cannot understand the things that are of what? The spirit. spirit. People of the flesh do not understand spiritual things. They only understand fleshly things. Notice this. When people, when I'm talking to people, I can't expect people to understand spiritual things if they're still in the flesh. Mm -hmm. They're carnally minded, as the Bible says. But spiritual people understand spiritual things. But carnal minded people, people who are in the flesh, do not understand the spirit of things of God. He says this, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. I mean, listen, we became born again. Notice why a lot of people can't hear God and understand the Bible because they don't have the spirit of God. People say, Pastor Q, how can you understand the Bible? I say, because I have the spirit of God. It's not that you can't understand the Bible. You're reading the Bible from the flesh and you can't interpret it in your spirit. If you were born again, then you would be able to hear clear what God is saying. Maybe you don't understand the Bible is because you haven't been born again. Maybe you don't hear his voice like I hear it because you're not born again. If you were born again, then you would hear his voice like I hear his voice if you were what? Born again. Jesus says, listen, my sheep hear, my, he said, my sheep know my voice. He said, a stranger, they will not hear. He says, my sheep know my voice. When I became born again, I became his, and now I recognize his voice when I hear it. And that's what I must be able to understand. I know his voice when I hear it. So I'm just, just piggybacking off what the Pope said. The Pope told the man that was gay, he said, listen, God made you like that, and he loves you like that. We must be able to understand this. Okay. We must, we must be able to understand this is this. God created a spirit. He says it's what? Psalm 139. He says what? You and I are what? Fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what we are. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me, let me, let me take you to another scripture. Go to, um, go to John chapter 4. I want to show you something real quick. I don't want to go to John 4. Yeah, go to John chapter 4. We were just in 3, so just all you got to do is flip over and go to 4. I want to talk about what happened with the woman at the well. Understand what, one of what the Pope says, God has not made us any type of way. He made us spiritual. We died in the spirit. We became flesh. And now listen, God has given us a gift to be able to get back to who he created us to be in Genesis chapter 1, and that is spirit. I want to be able to teach you today that stop identifying with your flesh and start identifying with your spirit. Your spirit does not have any type of emotions. It's not an emotional thing. That's why Jesus says in his word, God says in his word, he says what? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And what he means by this is this. He's always there even when you don't feel he's there. So I must be able to understand that even when I don't feel God is there, God is there. And how do I know that? I know because I hold him accountable to his word. Yes. His word. How many times have you and I gone through something and you and I don't feel like God is there, but God is there? Everything seems to be going on around you, but guess what? By your feelings, you say, don't nobody mess with me. Nobody is here there for me. Mm -hmm. You know what happened? I think when it was Elijah that went through the thing with Jezebel, he went and hid himself, and the angel showed up and fed him. And when the angel showed up to fed him and feed him, God reminded him that he was not alone, though he felt alone. God says, I have 4,000 more prophets yeah. that stored away that's just like you. Let me teach you what the thing that the devil wants you to be able to think that you're alone and you're all by yourself when you get into this thing, when you want to have this pity party and get away to yourself. And what God is teaching is this. He said, listen, you're not alone. You're listening to your flesh and you're not listening to your spirit. If you listen to your spirit, you would know what the words say. The word spirit, I will never leave you what? Nor forsake you. But your flesh tells you what? That I am alone. Nobody messes with me. Nobody likes me. Oh, uh, woe is me. Don't. That's what you hear. Why do you hear that? You hear that because you're in your flesh. If you were in your spirit, you would hear what the word of God was saying. Yes, indeed. Notice this. When we go through something, we don't hear our flesh. We hear our spirit. When we're not going through something, we hear our spirit, not our flesh. You know what I'm saying? You see the reverse in that? Let something go wrong, you won't be able to remember a Bible scripture. If everything goes right, you remember every scripture. 
You know why? Because what? You have learned to, what, to be able to identify with based off your emotions. Even me, when I'm going through something, I find it hard to be able to find the scriptures that I'm giving you right now. But when everything is going good, I can quote you every scripture out of the Bible. But when something goes wrong, I immediately, the voice of my flesh becomes louder than the voice of my spirit. That's why Jesus says, walk in the spirit that you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against his flesh. And you cannot do the things that you would because of the spiritual battle that takes place within you. Paul said it great. He said, what? The things I want to do, them the things I don't do, and the things I do want to do, them the things I find hard to perform. Yeah. I recognize there's a spiritual warfare going on inside of me. Someone woke up this morning, I really don't want to go to church. You heard one voice. The voice said, don't go to church. But then there was another voice that says, I need to get up and yeah. go to church. Amen. One voice said, hey, just lay in bed and chill. Amen. And you said, no, I'm not going to listen to that voice. There's yeah. another voice. But see, I'm going to tell you what happens. There's a larger voice that becomes priority is that when you're laying in bed Monday morning or Tuesday morning, you say, I don't want to go to work, your bills speak to you. Come on now. God. Has the rent ever spoke to you? Yes. <laughs> Has the car note ever spoke to you? Yes. It you is. hear that? I can't lay in bed. Why? Because the cell phones bill do. The mortgages do. You hear the, you hear the voice of your bills, but you can't hear God. Why is my, that? My, my. Priority. You learn how to be able to go to work and get, I got to get up because these bills ain't going to pay themselves. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, you hear the voice of your bills. Yes, indeed. Why don't you hear the voice of God when you're going through something? Mm. You haven't made it priority. But your bills will get you up in the morning. <laughs> yes, yeah, how many times you don't want to get up and go to work? What got you up? Them bills got you up. Yep. Unless you work, you got a whole bunch of leave. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the used all your leave. When you don't got no leave, you got to get up. Because you ain't being paid for <laughs> sitting at home. Yes, right. Do I got any leave? Do I got any sick time? Bill say we need to get up and go to work. Jesus, the same thing. Jesus said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass to me, but not my will, let your will be done. Jesus says, I don't want to go to the cross right now. But, he's, but Jesus was understanding what his spirit said too. He says, look, not my will, let thy will be done. I hear my own personal will. My will, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to read the Bible. But that not my will. Let your will be done. Yes. I don't want to apologize. I don't want to say I'm wrong. But let your will be done. I don't want to admit I'm wrong. But let your will be done. Yes. God, I don't want to do this. But I will if it's your will. Yes. That's how you got to learn to be able to live. You know, God, I don't want to say I'm sorry. God, I don't want to ask for forgiveness. God, I don't want to say I'm wrong and apologize for what I did, but not my will, let your will be done. God, no, I don't want to go talk to anybody or witness. I don't feel like talking to anybody about how good you are today, but not my will, let your will be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like it today. You know how you wake up some days, I just don't feel like it. I don't feel like praying today. Hey. Sometimes it's time to pray. Like, oh, it's prayer time again. I feel like I just prayed. <laughs> Then God said, what? Not your will. Let your will be done. Yeah. I wanted to lay in the bed this morning. God said, did you forget the calling? Mm -hmm. It ain't yeah. about me. Because, listen, let me teach you something I understand. I hold the words of eternal life in my hands. Yes. If I, if I decide that I don't want to come preach this word, you know how many times I'm not big enough myself that God has used me to be able to speak into somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And they say, Pastor Q, I needed to hear that word. Yeah. I do this because somebody needs to hear this. Yes. Not because I wanted to do it. It's because somebody needed to hear it. I understand my calling. I understand that what? The fact that the word needs to be heard is more important than me. What? Not wanting to do it. Yes. No. Jesus said, yeah, there's more, there, there's more on the line of me not going to the cross. So he said, you know what? I'm going to the cross regardless of how I feel because there's benefits behind it. Yes. What does the scripture teach us? He says, for our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be what revealed in us. What I'm, what I'm presently going through right now is not even going to be compared to what God has for me. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the things that God has stored up to those who love him. He said, ain't nobody even heard what I'm going to do for you yet. So, you know, when people come to me and say, Pastor Q, I already know what God going to do for you. I say, no, you're wrong because I have not seen, ear have not heard the things that God has stored up for me who love me. You don't even know what God going to do for me. He haven't even revealed it to you. You may see some potential there, but what God has for me, he said, I have not seen, ear have not heard the things that God God has stored up for those who love him. Yes. I he tells the woman at the well, the woman at the well, book of John chapter 4. The woman at the well. He tells the woman at the well, 
John chapter 4, verse 7. Give me drink. For his disciple has gone away in the city to buy food. The woman of Samaria said to him, How is that you being a Jew asked a drink of me? From I'm a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, Listen, if you knew the gift of God. Yeah. What we must understand, too, when Adam and Eve sinned and we died, we took on a curse. Jesus says, If you knew the gift of God. Yep. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes. So God sent us a gift. Mm -hmm. Notice this through Christmas, we give gifts. See what the devil did? Yeah. God sent you a gift, and you made Christmas about you and started giving gifts. Mm -hmm. God said, I, I gave you a gift. You made it a holiday, and then you put a burden on yourself to give everybody else a gift. <laughs> Look at the devil. Yes, I'm going to take what God had giving you and make it a burden for you. Some of y'all still paying off stuff from last Christmas. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about 2017, I'm talking about 16, 15, 14. <laughs> <laughs> That's God's gift, the interest rate of the burden. Exactly. We've turned God's gift into our own holiday to get other people's gifts. Make his own Jesus. Is that a gift? No. It's not a gift at all. Jesus told the woman, if you knew the gift of God and who was standing before me, you would be asking me Yes. I wouldn't be asking you if any of you knew who you were talking to. You would be asking me because I have the real gift. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who said you give me drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water. Jesus says, that water that you're drinking right now, you have to come back here for that. Yes. Yes. I like to teach when Jesus says living water, you must understand the scripture. He's, he's teaching something nobody ever seen. This Holy Spirit revealed it to me. Jesus is standing beside a well. But he is a whale. Yes. Oh, my God. Mm. Yeah. Come on now. Uh-huh. That's right. He told him in the garden, you may freely eat from all the trees of the garden. The woman is going to the whale, but the real whale she needs is beside the other whale. But she doesn't know it's a whale because it's not dressed up like a whale. You got to see where I'm going with this. Yes. Everybody that looks like a whale don't have nothing for you. My God. Mm. Thank you. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me let me let me give it a little, a little bit of a different way. See, if I came to you hey. with the robe on and everything, you would identify me as one that has the will. My God. But until I open my mouth, you recognize that I am the will. Wow. See, when I show up to preach funerals and I'm dressed like this, they say, "Who's the pastor? Where's the pastor? <laughs> uh, when when he gonna show up?" My God. I'm like, I am the pastor. Oh, and then they look me up and down his side. I'm like, mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't look like the normal pastor. Yes. But God, when I speak. My God. When I speak. My God. Then after the service, oh, bless you, Pastor. Uh -huh. the, see, let me teach you something. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just only big enough God in this. The praise I receive after I speak is greater than the praise I receive before I spoke. Yes, indeed. My God. Because they judged me by the way I looked before I spoke. Mm -hmm. I told them I was the whale, and they said he doesn't look like a whale. Hey, Jesus. I am the will, though, and you'll know that I'm the will that when I begin to speak. My God, boys, you like that. They look like the will. The Bible says they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Mm -hmm. Your pastor has learned to look like something he's not, so you can identify with what he's not. But, but, he has, he's, but what he says does not match what he looks. Mm -hmm. He has a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Mm -hmm. The Bible says they're all false prophets and they're all wolves in sheep's clothing. Yeah. They're all wolves in uh, um, suit. cavalier suit. I'm about the cavalier. <laughs> they're all wolves in Joseph A. Mann's suits. They are wolf, they're all wolves in men's warehouse suits. Yeah. They're all wolves in robes. Yeah. My God. They're all wolves in Harold Penner. <laughs> they're wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like the real thing. The woman's walking to the well not recognizing she's in front of the well. Yes. Jesus says, listen, if you knew who I was, he asked her for something. He was trying to engage the conversation. He said, listen, I know you've come to the well, but I am the well. If you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for the gift. Let me teach you something, as Jesus said to her, too. The woman said to her, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and, your well is, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Mm. He's, she don't know he's the well. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drink from it himself as well as his son and, and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. He's talking about the water in the well. Yes. 
But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will be coming to him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You know, there's a term where people say other people are thirsty. Yeah. Oh, she thirsty. He thirsty. You know why everybody's thirsty? Because they need attention. Uh -huh. They have a need for something that creates a what? Thirst. thirst yeah. So like Sprite, they're trying to obey their thirst. And that's what they do all the things on social media to be able to present the lights and everything like that because they're thirsty. They have a need for something. But let me teach you what. What you're drinking is salt water. Mm. <laughs> right? Hey. Salt water makes you more thirsty. Yep. Jesus says that once you drink of the water I give you, you won't have to post another thing because you'll know who you are. My God. You know what? Even when you don't get likes, you'll know you're liked. Good God. Yes. I don't need to get likes to know I'm liked. My goodness. Something I read the other day. Even when they don't like it, they watch it. My God. Hey. Mm. They see it. They just scroll by it. Even when they don't like it, they you know, watch it. You know what? Even when they act like they don't know you, oh, they very well know who you are. Not God. We're, 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 we're curious people, very inquisitive, yeah. wanting to know. Jesus said to her, whoever drinks this water, me go over here. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Mm. Now she wants what Jesus has. Guess what Jesus says? Go call your husband and come in. <laughs> Jesus says, you know what? I want to give you this water. But I need you to go get your husband and bring him here. Because in order for you to get this water, can we deal with what's stopping you from getting this living water? Go. Going back to what the quote, what the, going to the quote that the Pope said, the Pope Francis tells a gay man, God made you like that and loves you like that. My God. If that's the case, when Jesus sees the woman at the well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why did he tell her to go get her husband? Because he says, I want to deal with, oh man, let me, this is something God gave me in the way over here. God says, I made you one way, but you've been formed another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. God says, I made you this way, but you've been formed that way. Notice this, and everybody wants to preach the, the, uh, the potter in the clay. What he's trying to do, he said, listen, he, he, he took the prophet down to the potter's house and he said, I want you to look at what the potter's doing with the clay. He says, can I do the same thing with you that the potter does with the clay? Meaning that the clay had been what? Formed another way. You hear people say, God, remake me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. King David said it after he sinned with Bathsheba. He says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. God, what I do recognize about myself is that I'm not, this is not who you made me to be. Yeah. I'm going to jump a story real quick. The Bible talks about, what was it? I'm going to jump a story. And I'm going to go right back to that. I wrote it down. Go to Luke chapter 15. I knew I had it. Keep your finger in uh, John, but go to Luke chapter 15. Stay with the woman in the will. I'm going to go back to her. But go with me to uh, Luke chapter 15. But keep your hand right there. Keep your finger there and go with me. Don't let me get away from that. I will be back to that, but I got to show you something that's very, very important. And it hasn't been uh, talked about a lot. Luke chapter 15. I'm talking about the prodigal son, but I want you guys to see something inside of the prodigal son that people didn't pay attention to. And the prodigal son, remember the prodigal son was giving his inheritance, right? And remember he left his father's house after he got the inheritance, okay? Once he got the inheritance, the Bible said that he went and blew all his money on riotous living. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15 and uh, verse 14, it says, But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he yeah. began to be in want. Yeah. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed his swine. Mm. Now listen, he spent all his money with the, his inheritance that his father had given him, right? And now he goes to join himself. Join means that he goes and seeks out a job to be able yeah. to get money because now his money is gone, so yeah. now he has to go work for someone. Yeah. Can I teach you what's happening right here? One of my favorite movies in, in, in the world is Coming to America. Yeah. Has anybody here seen Coming to America? Yeah. One of the great stories about, and you write Kevin millions of times, if you notice that King Joffrey Jofra, yeah. James Earl Jones. Yeah. He was very upset yep. when he came to America and found out how his son was living. Yeah. 
What, what, what he was most upset about, too, is something that people understand. He came into the McDonald's and he found out his son was working. It wasn't the fact that he was working at McDowell's. It was the fact that he was working at all. Exactly. He said, this is the king. Why is this king working? working. My God. Man, listen. The prodigal son was a king's kid. Yeah. Who had taken a job as a hireling to go clean up behind pigs. Yeah. Listen where the king's kid had fallen from. Yeah. You are a king's kid, and you come to, just like the prodigal son said, and I'm going to take you through the scripture, it said the prodigal son came to his senses. How many times in the crack house, the drug house, in yeah. somebody's bed, at your lowest point, you come to your senses and you say, you know what? This is not the way I'm supposed to be living. My God. You come to recognize that I am a king's kid, that I was not Amen. called to be living on this lower level. Wow. How many times you and I have been at the lowest of the low, doing some of the things on the lowest of the low, and then one day you woke up and said, I'm not supposed to be doing this. My God, yes. Somebody got up this morning from doing something that degraded them, and they said, you know what, I'm not supposed to be doing this. Mm -hmm. Somebody's in sin right now, and they said, you know what, I'm not supposed to be living this way. I'm not supposed to be doing something strange for some change. I'm not supposed to be doing what I'm doing right now, and I'm really trying to find a way out. Yeah. You know what's crazy? Some of the things we're trying to get into, some people are trying to get out. My God. Yeah. <laughs> some people are trying to get into something I'm trying to get out of. Say it. I've come to tell you I've been reborn and be resurrected. Yeah. And my calling is to be able to try to maybe stop someone from going through what I'm doing. I mean, I want to do a ministry called Back to the Future. Yes. And the Back to the Future ministry was for me to be able to stop people from being able, not to be able to stop because I can't stop it, but to be able to give them information and knowledge about what I had been through yeah. to stop them from being able to go through what I had already been through. I've yeah. been through the prisons. I've been through the street. I've done things I shouldn't have done. That I'm not even proud of. I've done some things in my life, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest, the thing about it too, when they gave me the uh, the 10 year sentence, I thank God for the 10 years because the stuff I did, I should have been getting life. Yeah. So people say they gave you that much time as, as they 20 years old for drugs. In the back of my mind says, no, I did a lot more and I should get a lot more time for. I know. But I'm not going to tell on myself. Right. I'm still G and that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you got me for drugs. Good. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I take the time for the drugs. I'm not gonna tell you everything I did. Yeah. I've been spared from that. Yes. That's why I live the way I live for God. Yes. Because I know what He spared me from. Yes, Lord. Jesus. They knew some things. They didn't know everything. Thank God for that. But getting back to what I was saying is this: we must be able to understand this too. You get to the lowest of the lows of the point and you say, you know what? This is not what God has called me to be doing. Look what happened to the prodigal son. And verse 15, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He sent him to his fields to feed swine. This is a king's kid. Yeah. Feeding swine. Working for a wage that's beneath him. <clears throat> Have you ever felt like or your job or your career that you're better than what you're supposed to be doing? And then you start seeking out what you're supposed to be doing, even when you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is somebody's working a job they no longer want to be on. And what they're doing right now, they say, you know what? God has something greater for me. I'm going to leave this job and I'm going to start my own because I'm not getting my worth. Yeah. You know what? I read something the other day. They said the CEO had bought a, um, was going to buy a car. He bought a new Lamborghini or something like that. And. The guy said, man, oh, see, told the CEO something like, man, you just bought a new Lamborghini. And the CEO told him, he says, yeah, if you keep working, I'll, be, I'll buy another one next year. Wow. Mm. He told him, he said, listen, you just bought a new Lamborghini. He says, yeah, and if you keep working for my company, I'll buy another one next year. Mm. You. <laughs> really? Mm. Wow. Listen to that. <laughs> Somebody's getting rich off of my work. Yes. I'm worth more than this. Sometimes when God is calling us, the voice that God is speaking, this is what God is saying. You're worth more than where you're at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why it's not always like I don't want to be on my job because I don't make enough. Sometimes I know I'm supposed to be doing something else. Who am I speaking to today? My God. I'm speaking to somebody who's working at a place they have become complacent in, and I've given up on my dreams and vision, which, which God has called me to do. Wow. I'm working for less than what I'm worth. Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with... With how much I'm making, I'm worth more. I'm, I was called to do something else. Yes. 
but I allow myself to become complacent. Let me teach you something you may not know. If you don't go and do what God has caused you to do, God will cause you to lose everything you have to be able to get you to move in what he has for you to do. Yes. You're going to lose your job because you're supposed to start your own business. Wow. Yes. You're going to lose your job. Yes. God is going to close doors until, you're, until you walk through the door he has what? Predestined for you to walk through. Yeah. He says in Jeremiah 29 11, he said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you mm -hmm. to give you an expected end. God says, I think so much differently than you than you think about yourself. So when the Pope says God forms you that way, God loves you that way, he's wrong. Why? Because the Bible says, well, before I formed thee, I knew thee and ordained thee to be a prophet for the nations. Mm, I, know. I know the thoughts that I think toward, toward you that I may give you an expected in a future and a hope. Let me teach you something why I'm here. I, I got to go here while I'm here. When God called me, he didn't call the drug dealer in me. He called the spirit of God that's in you. Yes. Yes, sir. Let me teach you. When God calls you, he don't call a gay man or a gay woman or an adulteress or a killer or a murder. Yeah. He calls the spirit that's in you. Good God. Thank you, God. You're neither gay, killer, whatever you consider yourself to be in your flesh. Yeah. That's all in your spirit. You'll die a murderer. You'll die gay. You'll die a liar. You'll be resurrected who God called you to be. Yes, yes, yes. Stop identifying with your spirit. What the Pope told the man said, listen, God made you gay. He loves you that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God don't make us no way. In Genesis chapter 1 and 26, he made us in his image. Yep. He formed us in Genesis chapter 2, and man became a living soul. He gave you a body, but let me teach you something. When the Bible says... To be ye transformed by the renewing your mind. He says, um, be ye in the world, but not of the world. Yeah. Adam and Eve was in the world, but they were not of the world. Yeah. They were spiritual beings in fleshly bodies. Yeah. But when they died, they were now in the world and of the world. Yeah. So God sent them back to the world from which he created them from. Yeah. And now they have the emotions of the world. Yes. But when God calls you spirit and you become born again... Notice this in the spirit, and I'll, I'll teach you very carefully because a lot of you are going through this. The closer you say, if you draw nearer to me, I will draw nearer to you. Notice this, that the closer I get to God, I no longer want to do what I used to want to do. My cravings change, my desires change. Mm -hmm. Have you been feeling that lately? Have you no longer had a taste for the things that you used to have a taste for before? Yeah. Are things starting to change? You no longer want to do the things that you yeah. used to want to do? You know why? Because you're no longer identifying with your flesh. You're starting to identify with your spirit. And when you become born again, you no longer have the same desires. Let me teach you something. That desire is a process. Mm -hmm. You didn't get to where you were overnight. It's a process. Meaning that, listen, um, whatever you're dealing with right now, it's taking its course. It's a process. We're going from glory to glory to glory. His mercies are renewed daily. Paul said he had to beat his flesh. We die daily. Yeah. When it says we die daily, we die to our flesh daily. Yeah. The Bible said, who, he who comes after me must first deny himself. Mm -hmm. Take up his cross and follow after me. Jesus said you must first be able to deny yourself. He says you must first die. He says not only a seed of wheat fall into the ground. Unless it dies first, it cannot bear forth any fruit. People say, Pastor Q, I don't see none of my fruit. I say you haven't died. <laughs> Where's my fruit? You haven't died. You don't have any fruit because you haven't died. What does that mean? You're still alive and living with your own will. When you give up your own will and start doing what God called you to do and not what you have called yourself to do, then you'll see the fruit. But you must die first. Go to the prodigal sons. I have to teach this real quick. Verse 16 says, He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, this is of God. Hey. Notice this. I bet we didn't have money. Everybody was around. Good now when he have nothing, nobody gave him anything. How many of yeah. us are there? Yeah. <laughs> when you buy yourself, nobody won't do nothing for you. Yeah. See, everybody helped you when you was on top. Now you're at the bottom, clean up behind pigs. Nobody gave him anything. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure we had it. He was buying drinks and inviting me. You know, when we, we had it. <laughs> mm, yeah. The same people that you feed and buy drinks for and have over at your cook, I will not be the same people that are around you when you go through. Yeah. The same people that are around you when you up won't be there when you're down. Oh my God. You better yeah. be able to understand that. 
Notice this, when he was the prodigal son, he was out there flourishing, spending all his money on riders, living, he had everything. And I mean, he had everybody around him, but when he lost that, he had nobody around him to give him nothing. And I'm not even talking about money. Guess what? He had nobody around him to give him advice. When you read that, you think that he had nobody to help give him $20? No. He had nobody around to give him any type of thing. But listen, this is where I want to bless you at. Look what verse 17 says. But when he came to himself, Hold up now. Yep. He's in a pig's pen. And the Bible said that he has now come to himself. What does that mean? Meaning that he's at his lowest points and he comes into a reality and says, you know what, man? I'm not supposed to be here. Yep. You ever came to yourself? Yep. You ever came to yourself and said, self, I'm not supposed to be in this position I'm in. Yep. I'm better than this. You ever have to have a, a pep talk with yourself? You better. You know, women do all the time. Oh, I know he, you know, and women do, y'all do. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to work. Nah, uh I'm, you know, sometimes I, I just, I've drove past people and walked past people talking to they self. Yeah. No, nah, they ain't talking to herself. She's building herself back up. You better believe it. I heard a woman the other day talking to herself, building herself up. Oh, he must have forgot. He must not know. Yada, yada, yada. He must not know. When a woman does person, what she's doing is reminding herself. Uh-huh. Women are good at that because they, they know how to do it. Oh, he, a woman will build herself up in front of you. Oh, you must don't know. I have had, and you you must don't know. She's building herself up. She's talking to you, but she's building herself up in front of you. Oh, you must not know. You ain't the first. You won't be the last. You can be replaced. She's building herself up, but she's talking to you at the same time. Yes. Building her. Oh, you must don't know. What just happened? She said, no, you got me messed up. You had me out here thinking this way. No, but I just came to myself. Yeah. And when you come to yourself, then you begin to speak back to your situation. There's a song that says you need to be able to learn to be able to what? Encourage yourself. And what that means is this. When I go through something, I have to be able to learn to be able to what? Encourage myself. And tell myself not what I want them to hear, but what I need to hear. Building myself up on my most holiest faith. I have to tell myself what I need to be able to hear when they speak against me. All I'm doing is reminding myself of what God has said about me. And then I say, devil, you got me messed up. Mm -hmm. Then I say, man, you got me messed up. Sometimes people, we allow ourselves to go so low for people. And then they take us so low that we get to a place that we forget who we are. Yes. Sometimes I got to wake up my, in the morning, look myself in the mirror and say, Slim, you like that? Yeah. yeah. Even if they don't like you, you look good, you like that. You like that. You're the baddest out here. Can't nobody do it like you. Good I tell myself that. Stop <laughs> That's what I got to do. You number one out here. Yeah. You winning. They not going to tell you that. Nope. But sometimes I got to tell you, you got me messed up. Yes. Seriously. You don't know who I am. Hey. I got to speak that to myself because they not going to tell me that. Uh-uh. So I walk around knowing that. Yes, yes. No, yes. I'm not arrogant. I'm just living what you won't tell me. Yeah. Maybe if you told me, it wouldn't come off like that. Uh-huh. But I'm living in my own confidence. Yes. You ain't going to tell me. Because to give me a compliment means to be the takeaway from you. But that's not what it means. But that's just how you feel. Yeah. The prodigal son, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's higher servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? He began to say, you know what? I'm not supposed to be living. He said, listen, my father have people who he hired that are living better than me right now. And I'm a king's kid and I'm out here cleaning up behind pigs, getting ready to eat some chitlins. Ain't nothing wrong with chitlins. I like them too, but that's where he's at. He's getting ready to eat the pig stuff. Yeah. What the pigs are eating, he's getting ready to eat. So he reminds himself, he says, I'm dealing in the lower part of myself where I'm not supposed to be. I'm supposed to be at the, at the palace. Yeah. He says something very careful here. He says, I'm going to arise. You know what arise mean? I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up. When he says, I will arise, that means I'm going to get up. Have you ever woke up one morning and said, you know what? I'm going to get up. Yeah. I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing today. I'm, I'm going to get up from this. I'm down right now. Yeah, I know we love the song, We Fall Down, but we got to get up. He says, I will arise. You have to understand. He made a conscious decision within himself that says, I'm going to get up from this. And then the Bible says, he says, uh, I'm going to go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned 
against heaven and before you. My God. Going back, this is a perfect story. He went back and before, on the way back, his father was already waiting for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the thing about it, the Bible says that God said that he's married to the backslider. Yeah. You know why God is married to the backslider? Because he knows who you are. Yeah. Even when you don't know who you are. God says, all I need you to do is to be able to just repent, say that, that I messed up and I can take you back. Yeah. The Lord's prayer, Father, forgive me my trespass. We forgive those who trespass against us. Mm -hmm. Father, forgive me for what I've done. God says, listen, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Go back to the, uh, ch John chapter 4, the woman in Samaria. So listen, what I'm teaching is this. The prodigal son came back to his senses. Yes. He said, listen, this is not who God called me to be. Do you know what? Before I knew the Bible, just like you and I, I knew when I was doing some stuff in the street, the word spoke to me and God said, this is not who I'm supposed to be. Yeah. While we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for our sins. Yeah. You know how many times I talk to people who are not in church, who never read a Bible, but somewhere deep in their spirit, they feel a like calling. Yeah. Have you ever heard the calling of God before? Listen, I tell people all the time, a real God calls you before you even came to church. Yeah. You didn't invite me. God called me to come out. That's it. When God calls you, there is no settling in your spirit. Yeah, you right. Some, somebody, God is calling some right now. And someone doesn't know why right now I'm talking to somebody why nothing else is appeasing them any longer. My God. You're being called. <laughs> now the calling is dead. He says, I stand at the door and I what? No. Nah. I'm standing at the door and I'm doing what? Knocking. knocking. He don't stop knocking. You just don't answer. That's it. My God. Those in the nation of Islam is arriving down the street selling bean pies. They're giving out the final no. call. That's what they've had in their list. This is the final call. What they're trying to teach you, listen, it's getting close. Yes. This is the final call. Have you ever been in a situation where they call and you say, listen, you owe us money. This is the last time we're going to call before we turn your account over <laughs> mm -hmm. to the collectors. Oh, that was such a spirit you may not even know if nobody got it. What that mean? The bill collector said, this is the final call. This is the last time I'm going to call before I turn your account over to the collectors. Yeah. God says, this is the last time I'm going to call you before I turn you over to the collector. Yes, yes, yes. Who is the collector? That man there. Mm, the collector. Go to Job. Yeah. The devil comes to kill, steal, destroy. He's the collector. Your adversary, the devil, comes by a royal lion seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. Notice this. He's the collector. Why? Because in the book of Job, he came to collect. Mm -hmm. Didn't he come to collect? Mm -hmm. He took everything. Yeah. I come to collect. God says, listen, I've been calling you. But since you don't want to answer a call, okay. guess what God's going to do? I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you with this one. You're not even going to get where I'm going with this. Since you don't want to answer the call, I'm going to allow your account to be turned over to the collectors. My God. The person who God is trying to reach, he has allowed everything they have to be collected. Everything, everything gets taken away. Mm -hmm. So hopefully God can get your attention. Yeah. But can I teach you something you may not know? But don't let it go this way. Something I learned about credit. I took a class. If, say Macy's, <laughs> turns your account over to a collector and your bill was $3,000, do you know that a collector brought it, bought it uh -huh. for a cheaper price? Yeah. Come on now. And they'll sell it and they'll listen. And they'll make a proposal for you to pay it off at a cheaper price. Wow. Y'all don't get it. <laughs> so Macy wanted to give me $3,000 bill. They sold it to a law firm for 1,500 pennies, right? The law firm now tells me that they'll allow me to pay it off for cheaper than what I owe. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> well, this is all God. You got to get what I'm saying. Yes, now I'm paying the collector 
a lesser price than what I actually owe. Yeah. Hmm. See what I'm look look how that worked out for me. Yeah. And then I could just get it removed off my credit. I owe Macy's three thousand dollars. I'm gonna end up settling out with the collector for maybe five or six hundred, maybe a thousand. Mm -hmm. So the bad thing did what? Worked out for my good. Yeah. So when the devil, when God allows the devil to be able to come and to collect, uh -huh. he's setting you up to what? Be blessed. Yeah. You know what I learned? God showed me the things that I allowed the devil to take from you, you didn't need anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you learn to understand this and I'm going to teach you of a great truth. When I got locked up, I lost a lot of things. I was happier without them. My God. You can have it. I cried losing them. End up happy about it. The whole time in jail, all I talked about and all we talked about is what we had. We showed pictures of our women, our cars, our houses <laughs> that had been signed over yeah. to everything we lost. Mm -hmm. No one knew what we had gained. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Yes. Let me teach you something. Right now, you're holding on to something that's going to be taken away from you that you're going to be able to do better without. My God. Right now, you have something in your life that's going to be taken away from you. And when it's taken away, you're going to be better off without it than you were with it. Some of us have some things in our life that are killing us to be able to keep. Wow. And when we let them go, we're going to be happier without it. Yes, it was good to have it. But I remember the havoc it called having it. Yeah. When you live in that life, you know how many times, you know it feels good for me to drive straight home. Mm -hmm. I love that. And pull in my driveway. You know what it was like to, some nights I drove home and drove around my house two times oh my God. to make sure no one was following me. Yeah. You know what it's like to get out the car and think it's a guy standing right there in your mind because you know what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, my God. You know what it's like to pass your house and take your exit and be so paranoid that somebody has took your exit with you because yeah. you've done so much. It's like the ghetto boys, the minds playing tricks on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Learn every back street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You ever drove around your house three times before actually parking? Mm -hmm. Paranoid? Yes, yeah. Man. You know how it feels to just be able to just drive up to your house now? Yes. <laughs> It's not good it feels to be able to go places and not have to know who was everybody there before I show up. Yeah. You know how good it feels to be able to ride and have the police behind me and not think they're profiling me and not knowing that already. Listen, let me teach you. I've already created my story when that cop is behind me. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now when they're behind me, what you pulling me over for? Mm -hmm. License registration. <laughs> Ain't nothing in here. Mm -hmm. Feel good to do that. So many days I've been pulled over and I have life in my car. Yep. Or oh, not even life. I have something that carries, what, five, ten years and plus every bullet that's in it. Yep. The freedom now. Mm -hmm. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Yes, yes, yes. I'm free now. My no God. more worrying. Yep. John chapter 4. Let me finish this up. Where am I at? Good God. I've been preaching for a long time. All right. He says this. So with the woman who was at the will, he told the woman this. Going back to what the Pope said. The Pope tells the man, God made you like that and God loves you like that. He was telling the gay man that. But the woman at the will, Jesus said to her when she wanted the living water, he told her, he says, listen, go call your husband and come here. Yes, indeed. The woman answered him and said, Sir, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. He said, For you have had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Jesus says, You want this living water. And guess what? I want to deal with I want to give it to you. But you mind if I deal with you first before I give it to you? Wow. Now, if the Pope is right, God loves her. God made her that way. He loves her that way, right? If the Pope is right, the Pope said, 
God made the man that way. He loves her that way. He's talking to a woman who's in an act of adultery. Yeah. Wow. She has had five husbands. <laughs> and the man she had now is not her husband. If Jesus loves her that way, why don't he give her the water that way? Right, my God. You better say it. He loves her. He made her that way. He loved her that way. Why can't you give me the water that way? Wow. I'm going somewhere with this teaching. Mm -hmm. Remember when they brought Jesus, the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Yes. You know one reason why Jesus didn't allow her to stone her, stone the woman? Because they brought the woman, and the law says bring the woman and the man. Yeah. Jesus did it right at the well. He says, go get the man you're sleeping with yes. and bring him here to me too. I don't want to stone both of y'all. I want to save both of y'all. My God. I want to actually give you and him the opportunity to have this living water. Yes. Go get him because you know what? Going to get him is going to fix some things because you say you want this living water. I'm trying to get you to be able to get it. But I need you to fix this to be able to get it. <laughs> Let me teach you something. Jesus never said that she couldn't get heaven. He said she couldn't get the water. water. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you must understand there's a difference between getting to heaven and getting the water. Mm -hmm. The water is the Holy Spirit. Yes. He said, you want something from me. He's basically saying, listen, you can drink that water and it will flow through you. But he says, I can't give you living water because it's designed to spring up inside of you. Yes. And what you have inside of you is going to stop it from springing up. Uh -huh. What you have in you is a curse and you have sin inside of you. And the water is designed to be able to spring up into everlasting life. Wow. But since you're operating in, in, in fellowship and in death, I can't give you life while you're, while you're owning death. Wow. He says, so go get, the, go get him so we can fix this death. When they brought the woman to Jesus who was curtain of court in the very act of adultery. Yep. <laughs> the, the Pharisees and Sadducees brought her to Jesus to be able to test him. And they said, Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of, the, of adultery. In our law, Moses said that we ought to stone this woman. Jesus didn't even pay him any attention. He That's sat right. down and began to write in the ground. He was ignoring them, hoping they would go away. They asked him again. He stood up. He said, listen, he who has no sin within you cast the first stone. That's right. We'll and they all began to walk away, the Bible says. Then he looked up at the woman and said, woman, where are your accusers? She says, I don't see them. You know what Jesus was saying? Where are those who brought you before me? You know why you don't see them no more? Because they have the same sin. That's right. If not the same sin, they have sinned just like you. What would Jesus would have said that same thing to anyone? Liar, thief, anybody. If I bring you to Jesus... Right now, and judge you. If I bring you to Jesus right now and judge you, <clears throat> you know what Jesus is going to say? Q, if you have not sinned, cast the first stone. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. We're so quick to talk about people, but when we bring them to Jesus, guess what Jesus says? If you have not sinned, start hey. casting stones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's what we do, right? <laughs> He said, he who not sinned, let you cast the first stone right. since you have no sin. Wow. You cast the first stone. He said, you have well said I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you move now is not your husband. Jesus. And that you spoke, spoke truly. Jesus wanted to be able to give her living water. Mm -hmm. But she was living in a way that she couldn't be able to receive it. Just like the woman who was caught in a very act of adultery. When, she, when Jesus said, listen, woman, where are the accusers? She was left standing in front of Jesus. And Jesus said, you know what? Neither do I accuse you. Yeah. He says, what? Well, go and sin no more. That's it. You know what Jesus was saying? He says, listen, I no longer accuse you of what they're accusing you. Right then and there, there was forgiveness being activated and operated yeah. and, and demonstrated. In. Jesus said, listen, neither do I accuse you. But he told her this. He said, go and sin no more. Yes. He acknowledged what she was doing was wrong, but what did he tell her? Don't do it no more. Oh my God. But the Pope says, God loves you that way. <laughs> he made you that way. Right. The biggest lie they teach is that listen, listen, God loves you as you are, but he don't live you that leave you that way. Mm -hmm. I know That's the song right. says, just as you are. 
God calls you that way with all intentions of changing you. Yes. Can I tell you the first change that takes place is not even in your flesh, it's in your spirit. Yep. Yep. Just because you're not living saved right now don't mean you're not saved. Because there's a lot of saved people doing a lot of ratchet stuff right now. Yes. Bye, bye, bye. Amen to that. Amen. Everybody that's saved ain't living safe. You got a lot of God's people doing yeah. some ratchet stuff right uh -huh. now. But are they saved? Absolutely. My God. Everybody in church ain't saved. And everybody outside of church. And when everybody in church ain't saved. And just because they don't go to church don't mean they ain't saved. You got a lot of saved people who don't attend church. They know God. They, you know, they're just doing their thing right now. But let me tell you what, there's going to be a season when God is going to what? Deal with them. That's right. He says, I chastise those whom I love. I got to close because I'm out of town. But listen, what I want to teach today, based on what the Pope was saying, Pope told the man, he says, listen, God made you that way. God loved you that way. Listen, God didn't make us the way we are right now. That's God right. didn't make you and I the way we are right now. God called us to be different. He said we're peculiar people. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't know how life has formed you, but that's not who God made you. God made you a spiritual being. You are beautiful to God. God loves you. Yes, God loves who he created in Genesis chapter 1. God loves the sinner. He hates the sin. Yes, my God. He loves you. He loves the potential and that which he made you. So when God spoke to me, he says, I love you like you are, meaning that he wasn't saying that he loved me as a sinner. He loved who he created me to be. Mm -hmm. And God said, I had not given up on you on who I created you to be. I don't like who you have become, mm. but I love who you are. Yes, yes, yes. That's what God is saying right now. I don't like what you become, but I love who you are. Can I teach you? You are not what you have become. I had to learn that. I am not what I became. I'm not what the world done to me. You're not what the world has done to you. God says, I love who you are. I don't like what you have become. If people preach that message, we could draw more people to God. Because most people are preaching to you at what you do wrong. I know you've been raped, you've been abused, and all that. Guess what? That's what you've been. That's not who you are. Yes. You know what you know the problem is? We keep identifying with who we are not instead of who we are. Oh my God. Stop allowing people to label you for what you've been through and only take on labels that which God has given you. Everybody got the hashtag know me. <laughs> I hope not by what you display. Because you're not the same person on social media you are in real life. That's your representation. I don't want to know that. Who are you? Who God called you to be? First of all, you can start by going on by your government name that you don't even like. That's what you can do first of all. You know you, you know you mature when your real name don't bother you no more. Good God, that's a lot in that right there. I don't got to say young killer. I made my man Kevin right there. That's <laughs> Don't call me Kevin, call me Young Killer. <laughs> if I can't call you by your, the name your mama gave me, I got to call you Big Meech and Rick Ross and Scarface. <laughs> yeah, hey, you haven't you have walking in your true identity. Most of us don't even like to be called our real name. You know why? Because it identifies with our real self. Mm -hmm. I only like to notice this though. But when I'm at the bank, spell my real name right. <laughs> Don't put my street name on that chip. That ain't going to cash. That ain't going to I'm giving you a jewel in that. Can you put your street name on your check? Right. When you go to the bank, what they ask to see? Your ID. Ooh, and your ID have to match what's on what? Your, your check. So I'm going to give you this before I close. When what's on your check makes your mattress on your ID, amen. Exactly. Amen. My amen. God. When what's on the check matches your ID, amen. Yep. God says, here's the check I have for you. Let me see your ID. Mm -hmm. Amen. People keep telling me what God got for me. Mm -hmm. God said, here's the check. Mm -hmm. Where's your ID? My 
My God. Let's see if you match up to what's on this check. Oh, I am the voice. You guys be blessed. My God. Yes.